Awesome. I'm excited here today to have with me uh, Jewish National Fund, the head of Russell Robinson. Russell Robinson, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. Looking so, forward. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So for full disclosure, just off the top, um, I've been doing, um, my company has been doing advertising and SEO for Jewish National Fund for since probably like 2015, I think, for a long time. So uh, we already have a working relationship, even though I don't work with you directly. Our teams work together, um, but I think that's an important disclosure to put from, um, from the very top. But uh, in any event, uh, it's it's, uh, it's should, I disclose that you, should I disclose that you're doing a great job? No, 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 no. I'd like to keep it a big enigma. Let them okay. find out. They should right, find so, out for themselves and work with us. How's that? All right. So please do not uh, <laughs> do not accept my uh, 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 glorious recommendation for your or endorsement. Yes, correct. Yes, <laughs> the kids of death. I'm just teasing. Amazing. Okay, so Jewish National Fund is like a, is a brand that I grew up with. My family, my extended family, I grew up in Philly, uh, that we're very familiar with. Uh, and so my question is like, how do you think you were able to get, let's say, in my home, in my house? How? Why did I know about Jewish National Fund growing up? And how has that changed like generation to generation? And how would you say younger people today, let's say around teenagers years, or you can define how you want, how are they connecting to Jewish National Fund? So it's a great story because I think it's one of the great marketing stories of the Jewish world. You have to imagine we're 121 years old. At 121 years old, and Theodore Herzl, you know. Russell, you don't look a day over 70. Uh, by the way, I ate very well. Uh, Theodore Herzl didn't do as well as I did. Uh, but um, imagine, you know, we didn't have this medium. We didn't have NC, CDO, CBO, uh, SQ. Um, you had these things called letters, okay? And somebody had to hand write a letter and put a stamp on it and send it. And Theodore Herzl calls- I'm not following. Well, that? Theodore Herzl <laughs> tried to call people from all over the world to come together in Vienna. And he didn't have a YouTube channel. He didn't have a, a Facebook or he didn't have a, an email. He had to send a letter, send it out. Now, how do you also bring the Jewish community together um, that is diverse and, and from San Francisco to Bolivia to uh, uh, Buenos Aires to, to Lod and, and uh, uh, Ukraine. And, and tell them, by the way, I want to raise money for a cause. It's to repurchase the land of Israel. By the way, we haven't been there for 2,000 years. Oh, and by the way, I don't have pictures to show you. There's no maps. And by the way, there's no charity navigator and there's no anything else. I want you to be part of your belief, hope system of a Jewish people. And they created this thing, a blue box, which was a methodology. How do you collect the money? Let's come up with this blue box, put it in homes all throughout the world. People taking, taking food off of their plate, putting coins in that blue box, and then some Jewish national fund person coming around collecting it, riding off in a you know horse and carriage. Imagine on hope. And that hope turned from ideology, from a methodology to an ideology. The selling of tree certificates, by the way, was a fundraising methodology. Instead of having a chicken dinner, somebody came up with the idea, you know what, we're planting trees in Israel anyway. Why don't we come up with certificates that would give our message about a place called Israel? We'll sell the certificates that markets our cause and they get to connect to it. That methodology became an ideology. And that methodology brought you none other than the land of Israel for the Jewish people everywhere, 74 years young uh, now. And uh, that the, this organization repurchased that land to make that a reality. If we would have been more unified, Yoel, maybe we went around in 1939 or 1938, you know, we could only assume a million, five million, six million people more would have been living in our uh, borders called Israel. So maybe I, I should have maybe started with this, um, but what is Jewish National Fund? I mean, you've kind of hinted at it, but like, if you can put it in like two sentences, what would you say the mission is today? I'm sure, you know, it evolves, but this is the same core mission. Well, the mission statement I always use is the, we're the caretakers of the land of Israel for the Jewish people everywhere. Uh, in that land, it's not as much just to repurchase and ownership, it's caring, it's developing it. Uh, uh, Tel Aviv is now celebrating 109 years of age, 109, 109 years of age. The first 65 lots were at a Jewish National Fund lottery on a hilltop on the sand dunes of Tel Aviv. 
Today, that's Tel Aviv. So it wasn't just the repurchasing, it was growing the land, it was building the land, the kibbutzims and the moshavim, the 260 million trees, the farmland, the agricultural land, building schools, building infrastructure. And over the years, we have literally been the builders of Israel. And in Zionism, we are the connectors of, for us, the American Jewish community with the land and the people of Israel. And that mission we take very seriously with a big Z, not a small Z. And in Israel today, Yoel, we're about taking the nation still under creation, the South, the Negev, 60% of the land of Israel. Yeah, when we started, it was only 4.5% of the population living there. Today, you have the fastest growing city in Israel, Beersheba. Uh, when we started 17 years ago, 3% uh, uh, decrease was going on in that city at 190,000. Today, it's 247,000. And in the, in the Galil, 17% of the land of Israel, yet less than less than less than 9% of the, the, the people of Israel. We have a land of Israel, the Negev and the Galil, unquestioned, undebated. Un, un, uh, we have to move people there. And when you move people there, you grow there. When you grow there, you own there. And when you own there, you're able to defend it, own it, and, and make it happen. And we're seeing the necessity, not from the 1993 uh, uh uh, 1990s uh, Soviet Jewry movement. We're going to see it now in 2023. We're going to see Jews coming from Russia and Ukraine. They're going to come to Israel. And you can't move to Tel Aviv. Jerusalem doesn't have a lot of places. Haifa doesn't. If we don't make available and really work harder, as we have at Jewish National Fund, the Galil and the Negev, we'll miss an opportunity. Yeah, I, I totally agree about missing opportunities. So actually, you said a lot. So there's like a lot of different questions I want to ask. Um, the first is that you were talking about kind of helping um, Israel through, let's say, the, the American community. And you're sitting in New York. Um, people always talk about kind of like there's a, a wedge or a divide or there's a big there's a gap between Israelis and American and the American Jewish community. Um, is that a futile approach to try to uh, to bridge, or maybe not futile, but maybe it's like misguided. I kind of have this feeling, it's like, I mean, we have, we have two different needs, two different issues, two different challenges. Um, the American Jewish community or, and, and the Israeli community, um, and that maybe trying to bridge it isn't as necessary as one may think, or am I mistaken? I think you're mistaken. I think, first off, I don't think it's as bad as it is. And I think that it's important that we have to have a new conversation. I agree with you, by the way, it's not as bad as it is. Right. People, right. people like to play that up to try to uh, say, because to great me, I know Jewish how to solve political right. organizations love raising money on Oy Bay Judaism. And uh -huh. I'm so sick of Oy Bay Judaism. We, you know, our obituary for the Jewish people have been written over and over. 1964, a magazine wrote, a, a Look magazine wrote that the Jewish community by the year 2000 would be 2 million people and diet. Okay, yeah, so look, they, magazines I've, out of business. And anyone, yeah, you got to be careful of that fear mongering. They, I remember in high school, they made us watch videos of like, we're all going to run out of water. And da 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 da. It's like scaring the shit out of me. I'm like, I'm just 11th grader, just like not caring. And I was like, what is going on? You know, no, it's always, there's so much fear to try to get people to I cannot do operate on fear. You wouldn't operate a business that way. I always tell people. No, you're right. I can't operate on. You can't okay, operate on. I, I really like to sell you this, this uh, cup. By the way, nobody likes it. Um, you know, nobody wants to buy it. By the way, I don't know if it's going to be around tomorrow. Would you like to purchase it? Um, right. You know, what kind of a sales job is that? So right. I tell people, we are successful. The American Jewish community is growing 10% over the next the last 10 years. Uh, young people, the fastest growing part of our donor demographic is our 22 to 40 year olds. Uh, across the United States, we have an American- Why is, why, why is that, Russell? Because we don't hide Zionism, we don't hide Israel, we don't talk oy vey, we talk if you want to be part of the greatest adventure happening in the Jewish world, join the Jewish National Fund, join our connection with the land and people of Israel, join it together, not about 120 members of Knesset, we'll teach you about the people on the streets of Steyrot, or Kiryat Shimona, Be'er Sheva, or Tel Aviv. Come and be part of the great venture of the Jewish people that is going to take us another thousand years forward. And we're growing and we got and we have to have a new conversation. Don't come to us because you think Israel's on the brink of annihilation. That's not us, and we're not right. selling it, and it ain't true. 
how do you get that message across to, or to try to, let's say, uh, to those that, let's say, have been never been connected to Israel in the first place? Uh, the because they're growing up, I'm talking connected. about American Jews, right? You're talking uh, about that. never been connected to Israel for, in the first place. First off, I love because they usually don't have a preconceived notion. They just don't have anything. And again, I get them involved in the great adventure. We have to start in high school. It's one of the great faults the American organized Jewish community has been over the past 25 years. We've given up on high school kids. And, and we're not taking them on long-term programs in Israel. We bought a high school in Israel, and we're now 1,500. We're going to move it up to 5,000. What high school? What high school? What are you talking about? What high school? I mean, uh, Alexander Musk High School in Israel. Oh, yeah, Musk. Okay, great. Yeah, fantastic. And and we're going to – and it, you come get your academics. And by the way, 51% of the kids come from public or non-Jewish private schools. Mm -hmm. And out of that, 60% of the parents have never been to Israel. Mm -hmm. And and about 50% of those kids never had a B'nai Mitzvah. But they're at our school learning their algebra, their IP calculus, and 4,000 years of Jewish history, loving, living, and being part of the land of Israel and being part of the people of Israel. They're coming back as the great leaders. They're growing our JNF future. They're working in our college campuses. They're leading our community. And we are taking them on that journey as they go on the journey of learning about Israel life and our connection as a Jewish people to each other. But look what happened in the Ukraine, Yoel. You know, forget all the aid, forget it. You know what the great story was? That Israelis, part of our group, a Macomb group, Israelis, hundreds of them took their two week vacation on their dime, went to Hungary and Poland, to wheelchair an old person, to feed a person, to talk to them about Israel as volunteers. These are young Israelis who understood the connection to the Jewish community who they had never known. And they are having a, they just had Passover Seder, many of them with people in their home, two languages, but only one language, the language of shared destiny and common values of the Jewish people. No, fantastic. So people are inspired and people feel to do this, but I feel like there's a, a big gap. I mean, I went to a, a university and I went to Temple University uh, a long time ago, and it was already insanely anti-Semitic uh, to the core, down to the dean. Um, and it, it's a challenge. Um, I find that there's so much pressure and so much anti-Semitism um, in the American society and let's say in universities in particular. How does one cut through, how does one cut through the noise if all they're hearing is anti-Semitic garbage? And then when they hear something, they're, you know, they're like, well, I don't want to go against that narrative. You know, I hear, you know, Zionism equals racism, God forbid, right? Or a thing which is the exact opposite of the truth. Uh, how do you cut through when it's all they've been indoctrinated and all they've heard and they believe the media, you know, the radical media sources that they consume, thinking that, thinking that everything that they consume is real, is true, is honest, and you're coming to them and they think that like, What's this bullshit? I was warned about you. How, how do you cut through? Or, or are those people just so brainwashed, such a lost cause, that it's not worth the effort, that your, your, your effort's better placed elsewhere? Look, and I always believe there's 25% of the people that love us and 25% of the people that hate us. You're and very generous. Us, and the love us people, <laughs> I, I, I believe it on my heart, and the hate us people, I never could convert. I, I will right, tell so you. Right, so you can't. So it's a waste of energy. Okay, that was, that's and, what I thought. Right. Uh, oh, wow, but, you, but go online. We have all these Jewish organizations that are going to try to convert that 25% that hate us, okay? Now, right. what that does, you're in the business. Every time right. they're posting stuff of haters, they're helping the haters get better postings uh, and algorithms on the social media. And I said, why are you doing that? Well, we want to, sh we want to go against their lies. I said, so tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Let's tell our story. Mm -hmm. Let's tell positive Israel. I don't have to fight to tell how great I am. We are great. There's only one hospital serving Ukrainian refugees in the in the in the Eastern Europe. Oh, it's from a country that's only 74 years young. And if we tell the great stories and we tell who we are with pride, people want to join. The 25% that hate us, hate us. I don't want to help their algorithms. Stop attacking them. The people in the middle, I would rather them confused. I bring together to Israel 80 non-Jewish students a year for the past seven years called Caravan for Democracy. You all, you should meet them. These are Sikhs and Muslims and head of the Republican and Democrat, young leadership, whatever they are, right? It's a whole mixture of people. And they come confused and they leave 
at the best greater confused because they get to walk into a mosque and nobody attacked them. Oh, and they walked down the street and they saw Arab and Jew and Christian. They go, well, this is not what I was told. So I can't educate them in their 10 or 12 day trip. But if I get them to come back to say, well, what the stories I'm hearing do not make sense, I win. Because if I believe my stories are right, they're going to empower them to want to learn more. I bring college professors to Israel, non-history and political science, because they already made up their mind. But being a robotics professor and an agriculture professor, let them work with robotics and agricultural professors here in Israel. Well, all of a sudden they go, there's collaboration. I don't know, the storyline that I'm hearing isn't right. Right, right. The, all, suddenly you got to go behind the lies, right? Because there's so many lies. They don't want you to meet authentic Jews. Exactly. They don't want you to be authentic. They don't want you to, they don't want you to know the truth. So they, they, they hide it in light in the rhetoric. They're so anti even, um, so anti, anti peace, anti multiculturalism, anti communication, anti openness and all of that. And because all of those things will lead to the breaking down of the anti Semitic narrative. And I look at, I, I, I have a program called ZTV. We've been bringing on the narrative of Zionism. It's on YouTube, on Zionism uh, channel, on the Jewish National Fund YouTube channel. And we've been bringing a lot of progressives to talk about Zionism. And we bring people on about big Z Zionism and about the beauty of Zionism. But we as an American Jewish community got scared of the word because they we allowed them to steal it. I won't right. let them steal. Right, no, 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 nor should you. Ironically, I'm not a progressive myself, but I think Zionism is prob modern Zionism is probably the greatest progressive. It's as progressive exactly. as it gets. <laughs> really, By the way, really it was the, it was uh, the the beginning of the women's movement of mm -hmm. equality for women. You know where it started? Tell me. I have a feeling at you'll tell first, me. At the first Zionist Congress, where they allowed women full vote. Oh, in 1897. By the way, the first yeah. time in the history of the world. So if you want to be a women's uh, 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 person for women's rights, you better be a Zionist because that's what it's all about. Yeah, so well, I, yeah but, but they generally don't want, yeah. But you know, it's fascinating. You said something that, that's, that's resonating with me and I, I'm seeing it's actually a part of, the, a part of the, the general theme here is that Focusing on the extremely positive story of Zionism, um, and let's say I'm what Jewish National Fund is, is doing, which I want to hear more about in a bit. Um, that is definitely the right approach because people don't hear the truth and don't know the truth. And people are told the narrative, hi, hey, I'm, uh, I'm pro women's rights. And then they find out, you know what I mean? And then they're, and then they're brainwashed to support the most anti women, you know, I, I ran. You know the anti, where I'm pro gay rights, and they throw right. gay, and and they, they they will murder you if you're gay in the street, supported by the PLO. You know what I mean? And they don't know right. that. And there they are waving a, a Palestinian, which is a terrorist flag. They they had a, you know, and they they don't know any better. And the the positive uh, the positive message is it's uh, it's probably the most important thing. It's kind of it's more important to kind of like focus on your character than your reputation not really worry about what other people think or say, like be a strong tree, be as strong as you can, be as good as you can, continue to do the right thing and live an honest and truthful life um, of good values. And if you do that, you'll, you'll be very happy. And those that will hate you, let them hate. Who cares what they think of you? That's their, that's their issue. It, it's, it's fascinating the correlation between um, happiness and life satisfaction and whether you're a Zionist or not. I find those who have a hatred for Jewish people uh, they're far, they're very unhappy with everything and anything in their, in their personal life and the things that go around them. All they see, all they see is flaws. They don't see positive things. Um, and it's, it's very tragic that there are more and more people like this in general that, that look to the future, nothing to do with Zionism aside, and are much, and are bigger pessimists. You know, like I said, we're going to run out of water. The world is going to end. Da, 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 da. Everything's like, you know, it's always like trauma, scared, 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 scared. And Why wake uh, up in the morning? It's it's unreal. It's it's unreal. I, I I speak to some people and they talk about you know exactly the world's gonna end and you shouldn't have kids. And I was like, dude, you can you can take your life whenever you want. And save them. <laughs> Get out. Right. Don't, don't, don't tell me not to have children. That's well, when the world ends, just make sure this podcast goes on first, okay? Right. Of course. This is the only right. thing that will go on. It will. Uh, and after that, you know, we'll just take our risks. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. So I yeah I find that being optimistic is far more important. 
Uh, my camera actually got a little blurry because I moved. Um, so tell me what exactly is, so I know you guys have like a 10 year, like a plan for like a, a decade, a long plan, which I like because for some reason people struggle thinking a long term. Uh, in general, this isn't a Jewish thing, this isn't a Zionist thing. I mean, look at that, look at the Israeli and American government. Every government seems to only think, this is the problem with democracy, is that the challenge of democracy is you don't think past the next election. Uh, what do you, what do you think is, uh, like, wh what are your, what are you guys working on for 10 years? And how do you plan such long projects? So first off, it's, uh, we started uh, eight years ago with a plan to raise a billion dollars. Um, I will tell you that we're going to be hitting a billion dollars this year, but we're not changing the plan yet. We're just doing it two years early. But when we laid out our plan, it wasn't just to raise a billion dollars. We raised out what we were going to do with the money. Now, that's a risk. Nonprofits don't like to do that. But we believe that people want to be part of this ideal adventure and know where we're going. Yes, you got to change. By the way, you know, the Ukraine war wasn't in our plan. And you got to change because there's a different issues that come up. That's a business plan. You got to move it around. But when we said, we said 25% was going to be spent on next generation, working from K through seven, our American high school in Israel, college campuses in our JNF future. And we have done that. And I can show you the achievements already in all those areas. We were going to take and develop the negative. We were going to deal with the water catastrophe in Israel. We we're going to bring 300,000 people. Well, 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 let's go into some, let's mention one of these. Let's go into specifics. Okay. Let's talk about the water. When you say water catastrophe, what do you mean? Lack of water? Or the 20, 20, the 25 sea, like, years ago, yeah. there was a, you can Google from 20 years ago, they predicted that Israel would be out of water by the year 20, 2020. Okay? Right. Now, everybody was just going, ay, 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 ay. Jewish National Fund, and I give Ron a lot, of, a lot of credit for this and a lot of other people, we came up with a plan. It wasn't the sexiest. We had to take recycled water, sewage water. And we were going to put it in 250 reservoirs, and we were going to recycle water that would produce water for 14.5% of the population of Israel. Now, everybody said to us at the time, American Jewry philanthropically isn't going to give the sewage water. They like poverty or kids or orphans or, you know, uh, you know the, the distress and, and oive. And we said, okay. We'll take a risk. $350 million later, we raise for water. 250 reservoirs later, Israel reuses 90% of its water. 90. Yeah, I, I get reminded that. So like this espresso and this water I made was, pro was one of someone's waste. Okay. <laughs> like not too long is, ago. <laughs> but the point is, is the country next to us is Spain at 27%. Right. I know. It's not even, there isn't even a close okay. second. Right. So. You know, I'm always happy when people are like bragging about it in Israel. I have the letters from government and so on. When you talk about government, we couldn't even get a government person to come to a ribbon cutting of a reservoir or recycle center because they go, oh, I'm going to cut a sewage plant. Now they go around to everybody in the world how they are. The point is, if you got a problem, find out what the issues are. You don't shry about it. Come with solutions. And if you got come solutions, the people will come with you and join you. Right. People joined us and, and raised the money. The government is, is there a lack of leader? Is there a lack of leadership? Or is leadership so difficult when it has to do with such or with like projects like this when they just involve the government? Because I meet so many people um, that I mean, myself included, that comes up with fantastic ideas and potential solutions to all kinds of infrastructure and other challenges Israel has. But I feel like just it's so hard to cut through to the government. Is there a way for, for an individual other than going through Jewish National Fund? I mean, uh, how no. does one do that? So I'll tell you what. No government leads. Winston Churchill said it. Uh, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Right. Okay. And, and the issue with democracy is this, uh, you know, they will follow. So when we started with the water uh, uh, catastrophe, we were alone. As soon as we started showing success, the government has come and joined us. That's government. No government. Let's you elect them. Their their whole job is to get re-elected. That's the reality. It's our government. It's better than a dictatorship. So let's bless them all. The negative. 
500,000 people in the Negev. We were adding a seven mile river walk to Beersheba, a 29 acre lake. We were putting in hundreds of millions of dollars. And at one time, some of my leadership, we were driving to Beersheba one day and I said, don't worry, the government will join us. And one of my leaders said, look in the rear of your mirror. And I looked, I said, I don't see anything. He says, yeah, tell me when you can see them because uh, they're way, by the way, the government has now put in hundreds of millions of dollars into Beersheba. Governments follow. And to follow that, go to California, who's having a water catastrophe. Right. And if you wait for the government, well, you God, will have a catastrophe. We yeah. wait for the spirit, ingenuity of the Jewish people coming together, still in a nation under creation, work together with Israelis and philanthropists. And we would walk in and, and the government said, look, this is what we did. Follow us. We're doing it for the Galileo. And the biggest project we're working on now, y'all, is the World Zionist Village, which is going to be on 20 acres of land in Beersheba. It is not about buildings. It is the most unbelievable project for the next 100 years. It is not something for a year from now or five years or 25, for the next 100 years to bridge an entire new conversation of our Jewish people, not about right or left, not about religious or secular, not about Israel or diaspora but about what your generation and generations younger than you want to speak about. Give me vision, shared values, common destiny, adventure. I'll join in. This is the greatest show on earth. If you were to ask, if you were to ask, well, I'm wanting your opinion on this. If you were to ask, let's say, uh, 100 Israelis, let's say in their 20s, what would you like to see changed in Israel? That 100 Israelis in their 20s learn about 100 Israelis, uh, 100 American Jews. No, 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 no. Forget. No, no, no. What do you think they want to? What do you, if you were to? What do you think? If you were to survey, whatever, 100. What do you think in general? Young Israelis in their 20s. I'm 36, or even in their 30s, early 30s. What do you think if you were to ask them? Like, what would you like to see? Like, what significant improvements would make? you enjoying living, growing up, and raising your family in Israel? What would you like because to see? Everything you ask like that, Yoel, is, a, is an answer that's always going to deal with your own personal economics, housing, family, and education. And right. that's why when you have surveys, there's an automatic answer to that. And then they say, well, Jewish life is like list of number six. Well, that the way you asked the question was, I did care about my kids more, my parents. And I can't, you know, I just didn't, Judaism or Israel, or whatever, didn't come. Throw all that to the side. And I will tell you, go to Kiryat Shimona, you know, and I'll give you that. There are 14 members of the city council. Seven are under the age of 40. Mm -hmm. Go and meet with those Israelis. In Kiryat Shimona, mm -hmm. do you know why they ran for city council? Because our young people and our people kept showing up and talking. And right. they said, they'll tell you, guess what? We didn't understand this connection of Judaism around the world. And we're not sitting on the bench anymore. We're getting in the game. And so if you throw away the fam, not throw it away, but if you diminish that as part of the question, and then you talk about, okay, you have a house, you have a road, you have a thing, and they'll tell you, you know what? We want a connection. We want a connection to the greater- uh, you, you want meaning. I mean, right, what is the, the hierarchy uh, of needs? Uh, what is it right for you want food, shelter, all right. that. After your debt connect, you don't have, you're not in debt. Right. Or, or bad debt. And then, yes, then you want that meaning and purpose and the connection to Jewish roots. So the reason why I ask is because when I speak to young people and I think about like the big challenges that face them, the one way to keep people, Jews in Israel or in ex or in the diaspora connected to Israel is uh, is having people living here. And one of the greatest challenges is that um, is the price of housing the cost of living in general, right? So, I mean, there's like 110% tax on cars. So a car you'd buy in America for 20 grand costs you 45 grand, right? Like a luxurious, like there's like owning a, lux a luxurious car, like, like, you know, even a entry like Audi or something is like out of the question in Israel. Um, and so it's cars, gas, but the big one really is housing. And it, Tel Aviv is the most expensive city in the world from a cost of living. Uh, mm -hmm. it, yeah, and it went from number four to number one, actually, not because of housing over one year, but because of the cost of energy, gas, and produce, and all that. Hopefully, free trade, other things, they might, might liberalize the economy. But the big thing is housing, is that people see, I will be slaving, and I will never be able to afford the down payment, let alone the payments, on the house. Um, and what can 
Jewish National Fund or in general, what can be done to help? Um, a lot of criticism I hear is that like the government or other organizations they own, you know, including National Fund, the, a lot of land is owned by like, it, how do we do more building or de like, or de or cut red tape or what can we do to like, the, the price of housing should be cut in half, <laughs> ideally, right, of what it is now. The biggest threat today, is, I think, to Jewish continuity and Zionism is so many people are actually moving abroad. Because even if you go to the most remote parts of Israel, you're still paying insane amount of money through your nose. It's just so like, I, so I find those that are leaving Israel to find uh, a much better cost of living and housing that's affordable, Israel's done a tremendous job of increasing the wages. Like, like we're, we're up there, like really up there with Western Europe. It's continually to go up at a much higher pace than the than the rest of the than the rest of the Western world and OECD. But the purchasing power parity, what you can buy with your disposable income, is like it's like the lowest in the OECD. So like, what can what can we do to to bring the pricing, of, let's say, of housing, um, or do you think also I mean, maybe talk about cars and taxes and maybe uh, free trade? I don't know if that's that might not be relevant to you, but what can we do to like bring down the price of housing to keep Jews in Israel and afford it? And we're getting to a tipping point now, which is scary, because as I speak to people that let's say own their home like themselves, more and more people now care more about their own pocket than the younger generation. They say, I busted my ass for this insane down payment. And now my properties continue to go up. I don't want the price to fall. This is my nest egg. And so they're almost like, for only, I don't want the price of my house to fall personally. This is also my nest egg one day, right? But I'm going to screw over my kids, right? The next generation. And as more and more people, as more time goes by, it becomes a greater and greater challenge. And of finding more and more people are moving, Israelis are leaving Israel because of the cost of living. And there are other things associated, you know, education and other things. But the main thing is housing. What kind of, is there up, anything that can be done? Where did you grow up? Philadelphia. And where in Philadelphia? Originally Northeast Philly. Ah, uh, Northeast. What was that? When it's a suburb? That? It's a suburb of Philadelphia. It, no, it, it's it's part of the proper. It's part of Philadelphia property, but it's not an urban area. Okay, so we have, and you got to take this as a, 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 a way to understand. It could be Los Angeles or New York. In New York, if we didn't have Westchester, if we didn't have Long Island, if we didn't have New Jersey, we couldn't have New York. And what we have in Israel is we have a success story. We have a thing called Tel Aviv. And I'm going to use the Tel Aviv Haifa Jerusalem corridor. You have 74% of the population of Israel living in that corridor, 74%. So first off, security-wise, it's not so smart. But 74% right. of the people live there. It's who would have ever guessed 110 years ago on a sand dune that they're going to say, by the way, uh, build a home here. It's going to be one of the most expensive cities in the world. Okay, they would have probably, you know, took the guy and put him into an insane asylum. Okay, um, we need Westchester and Long Island. We need uh, the Valley if you were in Los Angeles and 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 uh, 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 the suburbs. Where are the suburbs in Israel? It is the Negev and it is the Galil. Now, to make it a suburb, you have to have jobs. So the housing, I can get you a house in Kiryat Shimon. One of four hundred housing sites went last month. 400 you get a front yard and a backyard now you'll say who wants to live up there so now that's our job to make it a place that is a choice by job by entertainment by culture by education to be a place to live at the arava when we started the place between the dead sea and a lot there was 7200 this is 19 years ago 7200 people live there the average age was 71 today there's 18,000 people who live there, and the average age is 38. Now, what has happened is, is that it's not agriculture. Doctors and lawyers are living there, and they're commuting. So we need road service. By the way, now you go back to government. I don't need government to cut housing prices. That's not the way democracy works and capitalism works. But the government has to be forced to build great road systems, great train systems, and transportation systems. So if I live in Livingston, New Jersey, and I want to come to New York, it's an hour and 15 minute commute. I have an assistant who commutes out to Long Island. It's an hour and 45 minute commute a day, but she has a train, a subway, and so on. We have to provide those opportunities to people so that they choose 
Kiryat Shimona and not London. They choose uh, Beersheba and not Los Angeles because they're not going to Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, by the way. They're going to Los Angeles, Agora Hills, okay? Uh, and they're not coming to New York City. They're going to Long Island City. So, you know, the reality is, is that we have to build that opportunity. And that's what I keep talking about, the nation and creation. We still get to develop it. Governments need to be forced what they need to do, and they follow. Right. Bring but population. I, I agree. So like Beit Sha'an, which is a place no one really wants to live, is going to have a train and will be able to connect to Haifa. And therefore, they will be able to have employment and people can have more affordable housing. But still, even in Beit Sha'an and the cheapest housing in Israel, it's still like $300,000 for like uh, a no, no. apartment. Off, that, let's put some reality there. Okay, just to show you how bad sometimes governments are. They built a train station back on. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've been there. We, we, we can all talk about bad government. Is. Okay. <laughs> they built a train station, Beit Shan. The only thing they forgot to do was build it in Beit Shan. Yeah, I okay? know. Okay. By the way, and if you study the history of railroad systems in the world, there's never been a, in, an urban railroad system that has not been built with the station inside the middle of the town. But Correct. Israel knew better. Let's build it 20 minutes outside of town. So, so first off, in Beit Shan, it's not so easy to commute. Second, let's take your three hundred fifty thousand. Let's take four hundred thousand dollars for four hundred thousand dollars in Beit Shan. You get yourself an eighteen hundred square foot home. You get four bedrooms, three baths, and a little front yard and a backyard. What do you get for that in Beit Shemesh? No, I, I understand that, and I'm not arguing with that. But the, to get the down payment of like 35 percent and be able to do that with the rest of the cost per living is is impossible. And so I may be able to afford it because I have above average income. But those that have average income near the median or or less, they they are looking at their future and the family they want to build, and they want to stay in Israel and they see themselves leaving. So I find I'm just telling you from literally everyone we I speak to is that. Owning a home, obviously, is the way to put down roots and build a Jewish family and connect and continue the mission of Jewish National Fund. Um, and so I don't know what you can do. I know you have I connections in the Israeli government that w we need to build, like, just to keep up with the growing birth rate without dropping prices. We're talking about what, like 50,000 units a year, 60,000 yeah, a year? See, I, so I, I'm, I'm fighting the government because I don't want to build apartment buildings in Kirat Shimon. Not today, tomorrow, yes, because you're not going to move to an apartment in Kirat Shimon. You will move to a duplex or a house because you need to Right, have I'm not going to move to a, right. I'm not going to go far away from the center and live in an apartment. I'll do right. that and live in a house. I'll right. live closer to the city in an apartment. I agree. What I will tell you is that there is the evolution of change. And the evolution of change is that if I get you to move to Kirat Shimon, you in plural, and you have that home for $350,000, what happens there? First off, you're going to insist on better education because you come from a system that you're going to assist it. Two, you're going to start going to restaurants. You're going to buy at the grocery store. The grocery store is going to get bigger. And all of a sudden, the quality of life for everybody is going to increase because you brought strong populations. How did we build Israel? And it's not to blame anybody, but let's take the reality. We used to bring immigrants in. Let's take in the most recent. Let's take uh, Ethiopian Jews. How many Ethiopian Jews did we settle in, Kyria, in uh, Tel Aviv? Oh, yeah, about that many. Uh, how many did we settle in Jerusalem? Oh, yeah, about that many. Oh, but we did send them to Akko. We did send them to Arad. And, and so we sent poor populations, undereducated populations, to poor undereducated communities. Then we brought Soviet Jewry in. And when Soviet Jewry came in, if you were educated, miraculously, there was places in, in the Haifa, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem corridor. If you weren't, you got a great place in Beersheba, in Arad, in Akko, in Kirat Shmona. So again, we piled on uneducated, lower educated, unemployed people on top of unemployed people, uneducated people. What I want to do is get those young, dynamic, yes, educated, entrepreneurial people because I care about the people we left behind and I want to bring their life up, but I can't bring their life up by developing low end housing. Mm -hmm. So how, so what are the greatest challenges with working with the Israeli government? Uh, you know what, first off, uh, as you know, um, the greatest challenges over the past five years is just deciding, um, did you get there on the merry-go-round in time? Because, you know, you don't know who is there, you know, and next election, next election. This is the first time in 
five years there's been a budget for the Israeli government. Now, you know, where Israelis don't even understand this on a day-to-day -day basis, NGOs, not us, other NGOs don't even get funded when the government is in political turmoil because NGOs are politics, okay? You know, one represents uh, the left or the right or the Labor Party. So they quit funding all these NGOs, forget where they're linked to, but they're providing food for an elderly person or they're providing services. Not us, it's these smaller ones that need it. So the, that is the shame about it. And the government, I always look at it this way, I want them to be with us and I wanna work with them. I know that once we get started and we keep moving forward and we don't get caught up, I've listened, I will tell you, there was a mayor once in one of the cities and he told me, you know what, Russell, we're not ready to do this. The government has to come first. And I told him, please get a chair, sit out inside of the highway and call me when you see the government show up. Right. I know governments, okay? Right. Mm -hmm. You very, change very, very population, right? All of a sudden, Look, it's so different in America. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire caucus are the two most important states in the entire world until after they win the Ohio, I mean, the Iowa caucus, caucus and the. And then uh, they don't, then they they don't, then care, you don't right? even know where Iowa is. Right. So democracy works that way. So understand it and let's make it work with us. Okay, I still don't know how you make them work with us, but uh, all right. <laughs> uh, I can tell you, they're always, they, they come from behind, and I don't care how much credit they take. One time, uh, I won't tell you the project or who it was, but one of the ministers was using uh, one of our projects, and they were using a lot of our words, and so some people were writing me. It was like going crazy on my social media, and I said, thank God. And they said, well, they're taking all the credit. I said, that, yeah, that's, that, that's a good thing. Yeah, no, I agree with and, you. If you want to have real influence, you'll get much more influence if you don't get the credit. Ah, you, don't you give credit. Silently give other people the credit, let other people do it. You can Jewish move National down. Fund wants results, not credit. What are the biggest barriers you think of getting the results of getting things moving and things happening? Let's say actually here in Israel on the ground. I listen, I'm more and more, it deals with about American Jewry and Israeli Jewry. And I'm gonna tell you this, when you ask about the young people in Israel, I find that working with some of these young people across the country, the young mayors, the young leaders that are all across this country are some of the most greatest people I've ever met. They don't have this inherent uh, oy vey. They just, they, they're seeing the light, they're seeing the opportunity, they're seeing the vision, they're taking the risk with us. You know, I, I'm working with mayors in small towns from Mitzvah Ramon to Yoracham. The mayor in Yoracham, a, a, a woman in a, in a Moroccan town, you know, she's fantastic. And to take a risk with us, because we want her to think like crazy, like we do. And, and, and she's there and she's leading her town. And you could go from the Arava all the way to Kirat Shmona. I see the next generation of leadership in Israel. I am so impressed. I'm so excited. And it's becoming so much better to work with. How, how does one grow? How does a society uh, nurture, grow, and find people that have leadership qualities in order to help them lead? Because I, I find in my, I'm just saying, in the private sector, um, I, I meet people all the time like, wow, that person has leadership qualities. I don't even know if they know it, right? They're just, it's inherent or whatever. I don't know. And you feel people, wow, this person would do great for X, great for Y. I mean, the army is very good at this sourcing good talent you know the, and placing them where wherever wherever they'd be best used um but kind of once you're older and you're an adult when you become a little bit like you grow into yourself and someone has ambition to lead to change to do they don't have the network they don't have the connections they don't have the funds they are no one wants to listen to them because as far as anyone else is concerned it's true they have done nothing with their life they have the energy they have the ambition how does one, how does a leader, one that is hungry to lead, but doesn't have the connection, how does one do that? Well, we're looking for you. I got to tell you, I'll give you just a couple. From Ramat HaNegev to Ms. Peramon. Ms. Peramon, we're building a, what I want to call a work hub uh, that is for that kind of individual. It's for the individuals that have great dreams, but they're not going to break through the Tel Aviv uh, uh, system. They're not there. They either didn't have the connections, the networking, or or the ability. Come down to Mitzvah Ramon and join our, 
our, our hub for entrepreneurialism that we're creating down there, that we're going to have a space for you to create with your partners and your friends, mentors to learn how to do. Some of the businesses will work, some of them won't. But if you have these creative ideas and want to lead, come to those places because we need you. We need you in the Mitzpah Ramones, in the Ramad HaNegevs, even in the Seirots or in the Arava. Come up to Kiryat Shimona to our Food Technology Center, or we're building in Kiryat Shimona the, the Galil Culinary Institute, the greatest culinary institute in the Middle East. It's going to rival Cordon Bleu in the greater Kiryat Shimona area. Come and start a small business in the Western Galil. We'll help you by how to deal with books, how to deal with uh, structures, how to put a business plan together. But come, because if you're going to stay in this shell of, of the, and I'm using Tel Aviv as the shell, and you haven't broken through, you're not. But you can break through and become great out there, and you can change the country and change the area. And I will tell you, just to answer your question another way, you got to start with teenagers as well. The Army does. The Army gives, gives you tests when you're in high school to find out what you're going to be in, in the Army. So we got a program, Hugei Sayarut, we work with, uh, Green Horizons, in Israel, which is for high school kids selected so that when they're 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, they're learning leadership skills. They're learning how to work with their friends. They're learning the basics of what is a leader. A leader is somebody who gets people to follow them and, and thinks it through. And that's a great leader with ethics and morals. And that's why we're doing a lot of those different uh, uh, works throughout in the Negev and Galil, because that is the great frontiers of Israel for tomorrow. Oh, fantastic. Uh, Russell, if people want to learn more about Jewish National Fund, how they see all the insane amount of projects at scale that you guys are working on, um, our someone wants to get involved. Uh, what is the best way to do that? So come on to jnf.org, jnf.org, or call, you can write to me at rrobinson at jnf.org, rrobinson at jnf.org. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, send an email, get, so get me on uh, Facebook or Instagram or any of the social media networks. And I communicate with people. It's, it, the, I, there's no ideas that come from this place. The ideas come and primarily from the young people who are creative and designing and are willing to take the risks and willing to be part of the fight because that's what leadership is. Part of the fight is that it's not easy. Part of the fight is that you can't give up. Part of the fight is there are bad days, but you got to plan the great days. And, you know, if we look at the great leaders of this world, the great leaders, if you think Ben-Gurion had it easy or Menachem Begin had it easy, forget it. You know, they had major decisions to make much greater than you're going to be made. And they were knocked down a lot harder than you'll be knocked down. Get into the fight. Get into the work. Get into the greatest adventure. And you'll be part of maybe not the Wonder Woman movie, but it's called the Jewish National Fund and Jewish movie of our future. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, Russell, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's an honor. You guys can uh, search for Russell Robinson, find him on socials. You can follow his personality, his vision, and his leadership and see what Jewish National Fund is doing here on the ground in Israel. Uh, thank you so much, Russell. I'm very happy that you're able to join me and share with, with everything you're doing. Keep up the thank good work. Thank you very much. My pleasure.